And I understand there might be a 9 o'clock event that some of you want to get to. So I'll, I'll try to do this quickly, but anything you want me to come back to. Um, and I wanted to do this this morning for you all because I've been getting sort of random calls from around the state um, from reporters. And I, I, there's a story in the Plain Dealer you might have seen this weekend, the Defiance paper. And so I, I wanted to make sure that you all knew what was uh, happening. And this bill um, will likely be introduced this week. Uh, it was actually my hope to try to introduce it to, today, but there, it's a big bill, as you'll see, and there's some things that uh, we're trying to get right before we introduce it, and, and LSC is working on that. So this is really kind of the keystone um, portion of this bill. Um, we have in Ohio actually five different voucher programs. And so I guess the first thing to start off with is to make it easy. This is, this is not a bill about the autism or John Peterson scholarship funds. Okay, so those have their own programs and, and we're not dealing with that. But um, the, we do have three other programs that have been uh, developed over time. One is the Cleveland-based scholarship program, which of course began initially in, in the mid-1990s. Um, and that is a, a we say, a geography-based program which means that you have to live in the city of Cleveland in order to be eligible for that program. The next thing that was developed was the, what I call the failing schools model for schools around the state that are, are um, you know, fall into some particular category. That category tends to change um, over the years. And then the third one is the income-based model that came in in 2013. This bill will essentially uh, have one voucher program that will be based on income, and I'll talk about, or need, and I'll talk about what that is as we go along. Um, the, I think there's a number of problems, uh, obviously with the geography program, if you live just outside of uh, Cleveland, um, you, you don't qualify, and we, we want, I think, want to get away from deciding what vouchers, who's eligible for a particular program just based on, as we say, the zip code. I think there's a whole series of problems with the failing school model. One is, I don't like the term, I don't think schools fail. Um, I think it tends to pit um, folks uh, who are in public schools, both the staff and the parents and folks like that, against people who use a voucher and, and go to a private school. Um, and with, with the testing uh, and a, a whole variety of other problems that we have with that, um, I think the failing schools concept for uh, vouchers uh, really should be something that, that uh, is in the past. Either, the other part to that is we have a lot of folks who are in what are deemed successful schools that um, for whatever reason have a problem with that school and, and sometimes they can open and roll but uh, really what we want to be able to do is allow everybody an opportunity to go to the school that they want. Uh, you know, some schools are just too big. Um, and what, one of the things that this will do uh, is that there's, in the failing schools model, we'll talk a little bit about this later in the funding aspect. We have this deduction from the local uh, account that the school district has. You don't have that in Cleveland or the income base right now. And so we have this sort of constant struggle about they're taking our money and using it to go to a private school. That will go away because, again, talk about this later, there's gonna be one fund and all of the voucher recipients are gonna be treated the same and the funding will all be treated the same. Um, we'll also get away with, do away with this problem we have where a kid's in a private school uh, he figures out, hey, I can get a voucher if I try to cross the street and spend six weeks at a failing school, get a voucher, and run back across the street and say, here's my voucher. And the system has been gained that way. The public schools hate it. The private schools hate it. Uh, but, of course, that's what will happen when people have an opportunity to do that. They'll, they'll take advantage of the system. Um, so this will truly be based on, uh, on someone's need or their income and not on some of these other things that at the time I think probably made sense, uh, but are really more arbitrary uh, in nature. So uh, there's gonna be a whole lot of other sort of 
series of things that are going to be helpful. When you have one program, the amount of the voucher is going to be the same. And they're different in these. How you access them are different. Uh, the time of year, um, a whole variety of other problems. So if we have one voucher program, it's going to be make it easier for the, the state to administer. It's going to make it easier for the parents to use and the schools to, to understand. Um, so the more accessibility part uh, means that we have um, higher income levels. Right now, the income-based uh, one, of course, geography and family schools, they don't have an income base, which means that within these, within these uh, programs right now, we have people that make half a million dollars you can get a voucher if you happen to live in the right place. Or, um, and, and that's actually true. Um, and by the way, I should say that the people who have qualified for these, under these programs, they're not going to lose their voucher. In other words, if you fall outside the income lines and you currently have a Cleveland voucher, you're going to get to keep the voucher the same thing. Uh, that was my mistake six years ago when I uh, began talking about this, that um, there's a lot of people who obviously have qualified under the program, but uh, now are not, and they're going to continue to receive that. So the higher income levels, um, higher than what the current income voucher is, is 200% uh, of poverty for a family of four, and that's about $48,000, will receive the full voucher amount. And up to 400%, um, which is about 96 k for a family of four. So you can understand my, my uh, poor handwriting. Um, those are, the, those are the income levels that, that are going to be part of the bill as introduced. And the value that we have on the is $5,000 for K through 8 and $7,500 for uh, high school. And those are higher. Uh, again, how much higher depends on which version of the voucher that you're looking at right now. It's about, I think it's 4250 for Cleveland, 4650 for the income-based model for K through 8. So it's not substantially higher, but it's probably a recognition that, like a lot of things, um, the voucher amount should go up because the cost of other things go up too. So the, 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 the higher value is, is, again, not substantially higher, but uh, we'll have one voucher amount versus several different times. Um, the flexibility for schools, I think, is a pretty important aspect of it. It's a recognition that even though we try to set amounts and standards and things like that uh, here in the state house, the world out there operates on a different scale. Um, we, schools charge different amounts for tuition. Um, some of them charge um, based on how many kids you have in the school. Um, and you, you may go, and I, I'd like to use city of Lima, as the best example, we have three Catholic elementary schools, K through eight. We have a Christian school, Temple, Temple Christian, and then we have Golden Bridge Academy, which is a private secular school. And all five of them have different tuitions. Um, these, and this by and large probably won't apply to K through eight, but in high school, high schools, especially in larger cities, charge 10 to 15, up to $20,000 in some places. Um, and the flexibility for schools simply says, if you come to us with a voucher and the tuition that we're charging is more, we're going to work with you, including we'll be allowed, to, the bill will allow schools to accept more money than what the voucher is, which is currently not allowed. In the example that I've, I've had a conversation with the principal of Purcell Marion a few years ago, and he said, you know, it's $12,500 to go here. Someone comes with a $6,000 voucher and wants to come to school. And we can give them two or $3,000 from our foundation. But if I could charge the difference to the parent, and if the parents or others were willing to pay the difference, we could get that student in. Um, and essentially, this is going to allow the, the, the uh, schools and the parents to work together to decide whether that parent um, can, can come to school. Now, it's important to note that the schools can't charge any voucher student more than what the tuition would be for any other student. Uh, it simply allows, in some situations, the, the parents to pay out of their pocket for at least a portion of the tuition, 
uh, even if they have a voucher, which they're not allowed to do right now. Um, the, there is a cap of sorts right now for all vouchers in the state of Ohio, 60,000, which there's about 40,000 vouchers of all kinds, again, all five right here. And it's a bit of an arbitrary number um, because the use of vouchers is really determined by the, the demand and the, and the capacity versus uh, what number the state happens to set. It is true that there is a limit on the income-based voucher right now, and that was set by the state as sort of a, a protector against an increase in uh, costs. Uh, but it, essentially in this bill, we're gonna, it's gonna be introduced as having no cap on the number of vouchers. And that's really a recognition that if, if the taxpayers want to use this, if their parents want to use this, if it's a good choice, we ought to allow them to do that. We've all heard stories about um, there's lotteries for kids being able to get in charter schools and maybe we've got, um, you know, there's 20 slots and there's 100 people applying and you've got parents crying that they can't get the kid in school. If, if this is a program which ultimately saves taxpayers money, which it does, uh, and a program that allows more choice, which it does, then it ought not to be capped at all. And so that's why we're introducing it, uh, again, with no cap in there. Um, the certificate of eligibility is basically a concept um, where someone will take their income tax returns, they'll send it to the Department of Education, the department will determine what, if they're eligible for a voucher, and what the amount of the voucher may be. Again, you know, someone very well may end up writing this spot, um, and that amount of voucher will have to be determined. This is 50%, by the way, at this point. Um, and so they'll get that certificate of eligibility, and they'll be able to shop in the marketplace of private schools. Um, now, you know, one of the things that I, I, I guess I, I think it's important to point out is this income amount right here is really a recognition that by and large, our, our middle income folks have been shut out of the voucher market. We've been able to do this for the poorest folks, we've been able to do it if you live in a particular place, but the middle income folks who live in, say, the suburbs who decide, I'd like, you know, this, I, I, I always have the example of the, a giant high school that maybe has 2,500 kids in it. A lot of kids can't do well in that kind of environment. And what is that person supposed to do, especially if there aren't open enrollment options, which often there aren't. So this is really a recognition that we need to begin to allow uh, true school choice to, to middle income folks. So someone may say, well, gee, that's $96,000 is a lot of money. Well, if you're a police officer and you make $45,000 and your wife's a, a teacher or a nurse and she makes thirty-five dollars or $40,000 and you've got two or three or four kids, $90,000 isn't a lot of money, especially if you're paying daycare and things like that. So they'll have the opportunity to go, um, that, that middle uh, class uh, segment of our society is, is going to be able to take advantage of school choice uh, really for the first time. So it's fun and different, I've talked about this before, but um, each of these three models are funded differently. I can get into as much detail as you would like, but the family schools model has this local deduction, which they really dislike, uh, and I think it's a bad idea. So uh, with one fund from the state uh, that this voucher program would be funded out of, there won't be any deductions from local school districts from their, from their fund. Uh, and then it would be part of a, and, and of course, interestingly, the Cleveland program has even a sort of more hybrid system where there's a portion deducted from the Cleveland program for, from their local um, formula amount, but then the rest of it is paid out from the state. The income-based model is all paid out from the state. So there's, there's three different ways of funding these things also, three different voucher amounts, three different ways of accessing it, and again, that's, that's part of the problem with even administering the program. So, um, we, this would be part of the education budget, it would be part of permanent law, like most of these voucher programs, um, but essentially, these, these different um, uh, 
programs are all going to be treated as one fund within the state budget. Um, and I can talk more specifically, but I want to make sure that I get through this in time for those of you who want to leave. So, um, this really is what our private schools, and the reason I think that's important, you all know this, but I've gotten several emails from people that said to me, I'm all for your voucher program as long as the vouchers don't go to charter schools. And then I explained to them that there's public schools, there's community schools, which we call charter schools, and then there are chartered non-public schools, which we call private schools, which is what vouchers are. There are also private non-chartered schools, which don't get any money from the state, and there's homeschooling and a whole lot of other things. But I, you know, whenever I talk to the press, I ask them to try to emphasize to people, this is not about charter schools. Um, not just because of whatever went on here in the last two years when I wasn't here, but for, so that people know this is about, um, uh, you know, largely, you know, these schools obviously are, are in all parts of the state. Um, there's about 170,000 private school students. There are over 700 private schools. Um, and obviously, a lot of those are religious schools, but there are uh, some that are secular also. One more aspect of this, which is, um, I didn't print out on there because I wasn't bright enough to do it. I think I forgot, basically. Um, is the educational savings account. Um, so the educational savings account is basically a recognition that, like most things in economics, people do what's in their best interest, both the seller and the buyer. And we had a lot of problems uh, when these programs were started 10 years ago. The state would say, here's a $4,200 voucher. Person would say, great, I'm going to go to the private school. They'd go down the street, and the school would say, well, our tuition is $2,500, but all these people are walking in the door with $4,200 vouchers. Aha, our tuition is now $4,200. So the state set the price, and the price went up. And, what, and that's a bad thing, obviously. Um, and, and so what happens with these educational savings accounts is let's, someone's going to walk in, they're going to have a $5,000 voucher because in their family they make less than what 200% of poverty. And they go to 